Hello, friends. Welcome again to Grace Baptist Church on this Sunday morning. Hope you're having a wonderful day. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let's rejoice and be glad in this day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right before we get into our message today. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter number 26, starting with verse 36. I want to look at how to handle sorrow. Sometimes we have sorrow that creeps into our life. What do we do when we are faced with sorrow? Well, we're going to see in the experience Jesus has in the Garden of Gethsemane how to handle sorrow. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time we can come together and share another portion of your word. Bless every person who's watching by the means of internet, on Facebook, on YouTube. And I pray the message will be a help to us all as we face times of sorrow in our own life. Lord, teach us things that would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. I heard about a man, he was lost, and he's walking in the desert for about five days, about to starve to death. One hot day, he came up onto a house and finally got up on the house. He found out it was a preacher's house. He's tired and he's weak. He collapsed right on the front porch. Preacher came out and nursed him back to health and feeling better. He asked the man if there's anything he needed. He said, well, which way is it to the nearest town? The preacher told him the directions and then even offered to lend him his horse to help him make it. Well, the preacher says, however, there's one special thing about my horse I've got to tell you. That is, you have to say thank God to make him go and you have to say amen to make him stop. <laughs> well, anxious to get to town, the man says, sure, oh, that's fine. I think I can remember that. And so... He got on the back of the horse, and the man took off. He said, thank God. Sure enough, the horse started just trotting along, trotting along. Then he said a little louder, thank God. And boy, it got a little faster and faster. Finally, he raised his voice to the top of his lungs, thank God. And boy, that horse was just a galloping and a moving as quickly as possible. Kind of scared the man. He was coming up on a cliff at a full run. And... Uh, he didn't know what was going to happen. He said, whoa, hold it. Stop real quick here. Stop. He's doing everything he can to get the horse to stop. Whoa, stop it. Hold on. Finally, he remembered. Amen. <laughs> well, the horse slid to a stop two inches from the cliff's edge, almost throwing him over its head. And the man panted. His heart was racing. He wiped the sweat from his brow. He leaned back on the saddle and he gasped for some air and he said, thank God. <laughs> and it was over then. Well, many times in life, we're faced with difficult days and the loss of a loved one, maybe a temptation that's following you around. A painful situation in the physical realm can always bring sorrow and sadness in the physical and the spiritual realm and even the emotional realm. Uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, they're all tied together. And so when we go through one setback in one area, it has a way of influencing us in all these areas. There's a thousand situations that we could bring a heartache and discouragement into our lives with. So what should we do when it's our time, when we're facing a trying time? It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy when that. Everything seemingly is going against us, is it? But don't throw the towel in. That's the easy way to get out of it. And really, you're not getting out of it. Yeah, but the best life is always to serve Jesus, following his footsteps. But don't quit. That's definitely not the answer. Because these difficult days are designed by God to teach us lessons, to build our faith. So we have to stay the course in life as God leads us along. And he, he knows where we need to be at a certain point in our life. And he's getting us there, slowly but surely. He's getting you right where he wants you to be. And so it's very important that we learn some steps to take when we're facing sorrow. Jesus handled the most sorrowful situation that could ever be faced by anybody. And that was his death on the cross for the sins of the world. You have to remember, 
In this passage, Jesus has just finished the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and now they're going out toward the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll remember he brought the disciples to the upper room and he washed their feet. He taught them the last thing that they needed to learn. And then Jesus foretold that Judas would betray him. Sure enough, Judas did. He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. So they leave the upper room and they go across the city of Jerusalem at night. Cross is only a few hours away. They get down to an area called the Garden of Gethsemane. They'd been there many times. I'm sure they had watched Jesus go down in that garden and pray. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him, and he wants them to pray with him while he's in there praying. It's a heavy burden on his heart. He's never sinned. He's never had anything to do with sin. And now he'll have all the sin of the world placed upon him. And they're going through these streets of Jerusalem and past 11, 12 o'clock at night, and they come up the Kidron Valley and cross it. No doubt the Kidron Valley, the little creek running down through there was probably red with the blood of all the sacrifices of the Passover. But on the other side of that stream, as I said, there was a beautiful little garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus would go there and he would pray. Now, here's the first course of action that we need to follow when we're in sorrow. Number one, pray to your Father in heaven. Pray to your Father in heaven. We see that in verse number 36. If Jesus needed to pray, we need to pray. Then come Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now this is a frequent meeting place for Christ and his disciples because just across the Kidron Valley is Jerusalem and a garden of ancient olive trees are right here around this area called the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus is familiar with this area. Judas is familiar with this area. I'm sure Peter, James, and John, they're all familiar with this area called the Garden of Gethsemane. So we see here in our text that Jesus arrives here at the garden and he informs his disciples that he's going to go a little bit further into the garden to get some strength from his father in prayer. Now, there's some times, friends, when we need to get along with the Lord and go a little bit further in that garden with him, pour out the burdens of our heart to him, some things that only he can help us with. We talk to him because with God, nothing is impossible. Whatever you're facing this morning, it's not impossible with God. He can work it out. He can take care of it. There are some things we can do, but there are many things that's out of our control. But it's never out of God's control. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. He'll give you strength. He'll help you in a sorrowful situation. The word Gethsemane carries the idea of an oil press. It's a place at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And when Jesus is in the garden, he's in an oil press. He's getting squeezed and ready to face the old rugged cross. He's getting ready to bear the sins of the world. And friends, if Jesus, who was God in the flesh, needed to pray, I think that tells us we need to pray as well. Pray one for another. Pray that God will uplift and encourage that one who is down and weak and out. Don't hesitate to get to someone to pray for you. Ask others in the church to pray for you. Matthew chapter 26, verse 37, knows what it says. And he, Jesus, took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Now, this is the third time Jesus singled out Peter, James, and John to accompany him on a very specific purpose. And he had done it in the transfiguration. He had done it when he raised the daughter of Jairus. Now he takes his inner three into the garden with him. They're leaders in the church. And so he wants them to pray for him as he faces the cross, which he'll be on the next day. But notice it says here, Jesus was very sorrowful, very heavy. Have you ever been in that type of situation? 
I mean, the word sorrowful there carries the idea of distress, sad, grief-stricken, heaviness, to make sorry. And we could say that Jesus was distressed. He was sad. He was grieved. He was heavy in heart. And have you ever been in a predicament like that? Has your heart ever been so sorrowful because maybe a strange child or a grandchild? Or maybe you're burdened because of in a situation you're in, it seems like there's just no way out of it. Are you burdened this morning because of something that just seems like it can never get any better? I've got good news for you. It can and it will get better when you go to your father and you pray to him. Pour your heart out to him. He'll give you a peace that passes all understanding. But Jesus was very heavy. The word very heavy carries the idea to be troubled, to be anguished, to even be depressed. Jesus was in such a great distress and anguish, it was depressing to him. Have you ever been depressed? I mean, you get to the point, seems like life is hopeless, never going to get any better. You feel desperate and you want to run away from all of it, but you can't run. Where do you turn when you're going through the valley of depression? I'll tell you where you turn. Turn to Jesus. He can identify with you because he's been there and done that. He has seen physical, mental, spiritual, emotional strain, pressure, depression. And thanks be unto God, he can turn away that hopeless situation into a, a moment of victory if we just come to him. We notice what the Bible said in Hebrews 4, 15. He is our great high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. I mean, when you hurt, guess what? Jesus hurts. And when your heart is broken and you cry, Jesus knows all about that because he loves you and he cares for you. Notice again, Matthew 26, verse 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now the words exceedingly sorrowful portray the idea here that he is in a desperate condition. He's very sad, exceedingly sorrowful, overcome with sorrow as to cause one to die. Jesus says his heart is broken to the point that he felt like he was going to die before he ever got on the cross. Have you ever felt that way, friends, when life has not been exactly what you'd planned it to be? And all of a sudden, you just feel like you're in a garden of Gethsemane being squeezed in from every direction. When you feel that way, friends, and you feel like you can't take another step, just turn to Jesus. And he will help you. Then number two, go the second mile. Don't quit. Just keep going. You may have to slow down a little bit. You might even get knocked down. But friends, you're not knocked out yet. We see in verse 39, he went a little further and fell on his face. And he prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Do you notice that? The text says Jesus went a little bit further than where they were. When we feel like we cannot go on, that's the time we have to make an extra effort. And we may feel like we're going to drop out of the race. That's the time when we need to press on for the glory of God. Don't quit. Don't quit praying. Don't quit reading your Bible. Don't quit church. You just keep pressing on with God's help day by day week by week, month by month, and you'll come through this situation. He will bring you out victoriously. We all feel that there are times in life when we can't make it another step. And sometimes people do make the mistake of just dropping out instead of going to the Lord. But friends, I encourage you again, that's the time we really need to seek the face of God. Go that extra mile like Jesus did. He went a little further into the garden. Notice back in our text here, you have your Bible. You see in verse 39, 
He went a little further. He fell on his face. He prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He's basically saying, Father, whatever you want is what I want. And he's leaving it over to his heavenly father to take action any way he feels led to do. Joshua 24, 15 says, It seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether it's the gods your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then Joshua says, As for me and my house, <laughs> we're just going to serve the Lord. Can you say that today? As for me and my house, we're just going to serve the Lord. Notice back in Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little further, he fell on his face. He says, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Now, he is so burdened down that he fell down on his face to the ground. I mean, the creator of the universe fell face flat to the ground. That's what you call praying in desperation. Have you ever prayed and burdened so far, and so much and so sorrowful that you just fell flat on your face? That's what Jesus is doing here. And he asked, Lord, take this cup away from me. Now, what does that mean? Well, there was a cup Jesus did not want. And he prayed that his father would take the cup away from him. And it was something that was coming his way. And he didn't want to drink of that cup. What was that cup that Jesus did not want to drink of? Well, evidently, it represents the cross and all the contents of the sins of the whole world. He had never even committed a sin. He was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Savior who was willing to die for you and to die for me. And so more than death itself, I believe just the terrible suffering of the crucifixion and the sin that would be poured upon him was enough to make him pray that God would take the cup away. It's a heavy burden for Jesus to bear. An angel came from heaven and ministered to him. His sweat actually turned to blood during this time. Listen to what Luke says. Luke's a doctor and a physician. But Luke tells us in Luke 22, verse 42, Father, this is what Jesus said, If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Now, what are angels? They're servants of God. They strengthen the people of God. They strengthen the Son of God here because he was so stressed and sorrowful. And then he says in verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed the more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We all have ministering spirits. They're called angels. And they're hang around us all the time, every day. They look after us. <clears throat> they take care of us. And God uses angels. Listen to what the Bible says about the function of the angel. Hebrews 1, verse 13 and 14. What is the function of an angel? Well, it says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemy thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I mean, this passage here teaches us angels are sent to minister to you and to me in our time of sorrow. Number one, pray to your father. Number two, go the extra mile. And we'll pick it up here this evening. Six o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this morning. And if you are burdened down with sorrow, I want to have a special word of prayer before we finish. Father, I pray for each one listening today, whatever the need is, God, I pray that you would help us always to seek our Father's will. Lord, help us always to go the second mile a little further. And Lord, you'll take control. And Lord, let us look to you for our help because we know that you are in 
dire situation in this Garden of Gethsemane. Father, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again, friends, for tuning in. May the Lord richly bless you.